Today I will be reviewing a hand that comes from day one of the 110k euro buy-in no limit hold'em main event at the Triton Montenegro High Roller Series. This is early in the tournament and the players are pretty deep stacked with around 100 big blinds or so. Your talk. All right, here's a here's a what if for chat and for you, David Tuckman. If someone said that they would give you twenty five hundred dollars or free roll you into this event, I worth like you know if I if I were to play this event, could I sell myself at like point two? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, I think I have more equity than that. I mean, poker is, we, we talked about this, poker, there's there's enough luck and there's enough variance in the game that uh, no matter how awful you are, if you know how to play the game, you should be okay. Ace-Jack versus Queen-Jack, and there's a Jack. This was a three-bet pot. This is what it's like on the TV. So Dan Larson opens the action in low-jack, raising 2.5x with Ace-Jack off. Linus three bets 3.2x in the high-jack with Queen-Jack suited. Dan calls and the flop comes 9 6 jack with two diamonds and a club, and Dan checks. Before we begin the analysis, I want to show some of the inputs I'm using, which someone asked about in the prior vid. And it's a great question because the solver's outputs will only be as good as the inputs provided. As you can see, I've cut off a digit on the pot and stack sizes because Pio won't process the full amounts. In terms of betting, generally I try to provide for a quarter pot, half pot, and full pot size bets on each street, usually with some overbetting options on the river. I also try to include raises and three bets on each street as well. I am somewhat limited on the inputs I can include because I'm on a laptop, so some trees become too much for it to handle. I solved this hand to around 0.03% accuracy for this video. But for my own sims, I usually solve to around 0.5% or 0.1% since it takes much less time to process and the results usually aren't too far off from the fully solved tree. So getting back to the hand, Dan checks with top top and we see that Pio checks 99% of its range here. I should note that this, the basis for this range comes from Poker Snowy, uh, but I added a few holdings to make it a bit looser. This range includes most suited broadways, a good portion of pocket pairs, including a smidgen of pocket queens, most suited aces, some suited connectors, and a few of the stronger offsuit broadway hands. Half naked women in your photos that people will like them more. For free. More work. The, the women aren't half naked. Of a company <laughs> for 30 and Linus checks behind. In Linus's position, we see that on this board, Pi was using mostly a mixed strategy, betting around half of the time. And this is a three bet range I've given Linus, which will include most jacks plus, most ace jack plus, some suited broadways, as well as some bluff combos, such as a few suited aces, and to a lesser extent, a handful of suited connectors and mid to low pairs. I'm not sure how many people bluff these mid to low pairs in real life, but I've kept them in the range because I'd rather err on the side of being over-inclusive rather than under-inclusive. And if we look at Linus's holding, queen-jack suited, we see that the solver is checking behind basically 100% of the time, which was a bit surprising to me. Linus 3-bet preflop with a hand that has decent equity against most ranges, but I would characterize it more as a 3-bet bluff, and he has top pair which is a hand that could use protection against a lot of ace-x, king-x, or draws that the three-bet caller has in his range, and I think many players would be happy to try to take down the pot here with a large bet. However, if we take a closer look at the preflop caller's range, we will see that he actually has an overall equity advantage, and I think a nuttiness advantage as well. Linus, as the preflop raiser, will have more overpairs, but Dan, as the preflop caller, should have all the sets, since preflop, Dan would have the correct odds to call most of his pocket pairs to a 3-bet. Also, it's possible Dan could have called with a stronger jack, as he did here, or even possibly pocket queens, and he may also have some two pairs, depending on his 3-bet calling range. So it does make sense for Linus to proceed with some caution, given the board generally favors the caller's range, and this is a holding where it would be difficult to get three streets of value in any event. I should note that Pio does say that betting quarter or half pot here is similar in, in EV to checking, and holding a backdoor flush draw will give you even a bit more EV, 
but as played, Linus decides to take a more passive route, and we go to the turn. Whatever I am. Is he making a video? Oh, this is a wow. real Turn. troubling card for Bad Linus Lilliger. Linus Laws. And no one says a word here except me. I'm the only one talking. But I'm I'm still fighting. I'm still fighting. We're all, we're fighting, right, Paul? Yes. Yes. Yeah, we're fighting. Uh, yeah. We uh, Lehigh. Lehigh. That's all I can think to say. Lehigh University. This went check, check on the flop, by the way. I don't want to interrupt Kate's, but what a hand we've developed here in a three-bet pot. There's 74,000 in there. So the turn brings a jack of hearts, which gives both players trips. Dan leads out with a half-pot bet, and we see that Pio bets most of its range here, mixing up its sizing, but generally favoring a quarter-pot bet to open the action. If we look at the ace-jack holdings, we see that Pio is betting most of these combos. Uh, interestingly, Pio favors a full pot size bet when holding the Ace of Diamonds, which I'm guessing is because it blocks many of the flushes Linus has in his range, uh, which would have decent equity against Dan going to the river. These were not two small stacks. We've got over 100,000 in the middle. Both players are likely to be quite excited about their hand. I need flip flop. Huh? Post on Chinese? Yes. And Linus calls behind. We see that Pio does prefer calling with Queen Jack, but the EVs of calling or raising run pretty close together, so it seems a raise would be okay here as well. Uh, but one thing I've noticed is that when holding a strong hand in position, Pio often favors simply calling bets and allowing the opponent to build the pot and reserving a possible raise until later streets to maximize value, right? We see that quads and full houses are similarly just calling here. However, I do want to note uh, that these ace-jack holdings are raising here most of the time, which makes sense since you do need some value hands that raise to protect some of the bluffs you may want to raise here with, such as some of these nut flush draws. 10 million lives. 30 million likes. Oh, yeah, that's 30 million likes. Diamond's yeah. got there, but... You know what? Maybe I will do that, Larson's actually. holding the ace of diamonds. Have, uh, some yeah, and both these players check the flop. Genius. Definitely under-repping their hands. I'm working on my likes. I'm getting lots of likes. <laughs> Followers and stuff. Dan Cade, social media guru. Yeah. I was inspired by a couple people who have... Uh, Millions of followers. Yeah, he figured out that if you put <laughs> half-naked women in your photos, that people will like them more. For free. And the river brings a four of diamonds, completing the flush. And Dan bets small around 24% of the pot. And we see that Pio bets most of its range here, again favoring a smaller sizing against Linus's passive line. However, if we look at Dan's particular cards, we see that when holding the ace of diamonds, Pio actually favors a larger 2x pot over bet, which I think shows how powerful blocking the nut flush can be. More work. The, the women aren't half naked. a piece of a company <laughs> for 30,000 euros, and this motherfucker with five, 5 million followers didn't do anything. He Language. Like a bigger piece than me. Thinking, what the fuck's going on? Larson bet 35,000, a really small Three bet. Minutes. I think he's probably trying to induce a raise. Well, and also, I, I don't know if he thinks his opponent actually has that much. I mean, the way the hand played out, right? Linus doesn't need to have a, a big hand here. He could even have an ace high. I guess it's hard for him to have that much here. So yeah. Right. What are, you, what are you doing right now? Are you doing something? Nope. I mean, I don't post on social media. Yeah, yeah. I just play for Linus Lager just, just called. Just called. No, I mean, You're, right he's now. a god. Oh, right now, no just called. How do you just call that? I mean, I guess the simple oh, uh, answer is you only get action if you're beat. That's not true, though. That's the thing. That's <laughs> right. the amazing thing. That is an amazing, you know, the best players in the world, you know, they lose the least when they get coolered. And yeah. what an example of that. Linus checks back the flop, just calls turn and just calls a small bet, which would induce a lot of players to raise the river. And he doesn't bite. Great play by Linus, man. He saved himself at least 100,000 chips, if not all, by the way. I mean, you could have made the argument that all the chips go in. What a play. 
Let us know what you think about that one. So Linus decides to call behind, which ultimately was the correct play and ended up saving him many chips. But is it GTO? Well, here we see that Pio will actually raise these trips 100% of the time, favoring the larger 4.4x sizing. This result may be a bit unexpected. Some people assume that with the paired board and the flush getting there, this is an obvious check. But as we know, GTO strategy does not focus on specific hands, but rather considers entire ranges. So what does that mean as a practical matter? Well, in my experience, it seems that in the context of value hands, Pio generally wants to set a price by the river based on the holding's value or worth relative to the distribution of the villain's entire range. And Trip Jacks should be relatively high up in Dan's distribution since he should have a number of two pair combos here. But nonetheless, Linus simply calls behind. So did this prove once and for all that Linus is in fact human and not an android sent from the future to crush high stakes poker? Well, perhaps. But we've seen Linus in the past makes bets in similar spots to get thin value. This may actually be a situation where Linus knows what the GTO play is, but is purposely deviating from it by taking into account exploitative factors, which is one thing Pio cannot do. So what are the potential exploitative factors in play here? Well, for one, this bet river bet, I think, seems quite suspicious, particularly for a 3-bet pod. Not only is it small in the absolute sense, since it's only 24% of pot on the river, but it's also a down bet from the turn. It just seems to be screaming for a raise. And we do see that Paya will lead in Dan's shoes with a smallish bet, holding more nuttish hands such as full houses and weaker flushes that have Linus crushed. But without knowing Dan's specific cards, the question that Linus has to ask himself in this spot is how often will Dan be betting small here for value with a hand that Linus is beating but could also call a raise? Well, what do we know about Dan Larson? Not much. I looked him up on Hendon and on Pocket Fives and it seems like he has very few results. It doesn't appear that he's a high stakes crusher live or online. It seems like he may just be a guy who's taking a shot at a high roller against some of the best tournament players in the world. And I think the common perception of players like this is that they tend to play tighter than optimal. And if that assumption is correct, you wouldn't think he would make this type of small bet with a marginal hand. Think about it. If you had pocket fives or a pair of nines or even pocket queens in this three bet pot on this paired and flushed board, would you attempt to throw out a weak bet against this guy? I think a tighter player would probably prefer checking here with the hopes of getting to a cheap showdown instead of putting out a tiny, seemingly raise-inducing bet against one of the end bosses in the tournament that also has him covered. And if we want to see what the GTO play here would be if Dan were playing tighter than optimal, we can use Pio's node lock feature to force Dan to check most of his marginal hands and see how that alters Linus's strategy. So here we are forcing Dan to check most of his two pair hands, uh, only allowing him to bet this small sizing around 10% of the time, which is contrasted to the optimal range, which is betting most of its marginal hands. And as we can see, this causes the GTO strategy for Linus to change quite dramatically. Previously, this area was all dark red, with Pio recommending a large raise 100% of the time. But now that we have forced Dan to check most of his marginal hands, this area is almost all green, showing that the optimal play against a tighter player in this spot is to simply call behind. Additionally, there are tournament considerations to take into account as well. If Linus raised here, he would likely end up losing at least half of his stack and perhaps more. If, for example, Linus decided to raise and then Dan 3-bet, from a GTO perspective, Linus would need to call off a decent amount of time, which makes reopening the action with a raise a dangerous proposition. And although the players are deep stacked and I believe rebuys were still allowed at this point, it seems that in tournaments, players tend to err more on the side of caution relative to cash games, where there are endless rebuys. I don't know how much Linus was being staked here, but it may not be so easy for him to fire multiple bullets in a 110k euro tournament which is a much different scenario from the 10k buy-in cash games he regs. Also, we see that the EV loss of checking the trips relative to betting is not huge. He's losing around 2,000 to 3,000 ships in EV, which is less than a big blind. 
So taking all of that into account, you could argue that the potential addition of value Linus might get from raising here may not be worth it considering the, the potential magnitude of the loss. So in conclusion, what are the takeaways from this vid? Well, for one, we now know that Linus does not in fact win every pot he's in. I think this hand also reinforces the often repeated mantra that playing good poker is not always about winning those huge pots, but just as important as minimizing your losses. The reality is the chips you save from losing have the same value as the chips you win. There were multiple points in this hand where Linus could have easily bloated the pot, particularly on the flop, but he showed restraint and ultimately ended up losing the bare minimum. There are many players out there that would view this type of scenario just as a cooler spot where they would throw their hands in the air and say, well, if you got me, you got me, and get their stacks in. But obviously that is not refined or thoughtful poker. So that's it for today. Hope this was interesting. Uh, thanks so much for all the subscribes, likes, and comments. I really appreciate it, and please keep them coming. Until next time, thanks.